Okay, so uh, first I'd like to thank the organizers for, for putting this meeting together and for, for inviting me. And so today's talk is going to be some sort of a follow-up to Alexandra's talk yesterday. And uh, I will exclusively talk about analysis of data that was collected by the group in Rome uh, that, uh, and the data that uh, Stefania explained how to obtain beautifully in the, in the previous talk. And uh, this was what I'm going to talk about was also, of course, a collaboration with Alexandra Valchak and also with uh, Francesco Ginelli at uh, Aberdeen University. So, but first, uh, before going into, uh, into my talk, I just wanted to, to, to give a fir you know, first slide about maybe emphasizing the, the generality of collective behavior and especially of emergent collective behavior, not just in animal groups, but at any scale in biology. I think that's a useful thing to remember. So there's, you know, there's collective behavior even at the molecular scale, if you think of allosteroid, for instance, cooperative binding. Uh, and then, you know, at the cellular scale, like uh, neuroscience is a, an example of uh, collective behavior of many cells together or multicellularity problem. And of course, uh, animal groups, which is what uh, we, we, most of us are, are talking about uh, during this meeting. So the, the system we're going to talk about is a uh, flock of starlings. So this is the movie you already saw yesterday. So maybe you don't have to stare at it so, so much. And this is the same slide you saw yesterday. So this is the data that was collected by, in a group of uh, Irene Gardina and Andrea Cavagna in the past few years. And uh, they managed, as you saw in, uh, in uh, Stefania's talk, to reconstruct the 3D position and velocities of up to you know, thousands of birds in the same flock. And, um, and the amazing thing is the amount of coordination, but not just the amount of coordination, but also the wide uh, length scales over which individuals are, are, are correlated with each other. And, um, when you see this as a physicist, your first reaction is, wow, you know, this, this reminds me of something. And uh, it reminds me of, of, of interacting uh, models in, in statistical mechanics, the, the prime example of which is uh, the Ising model. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very old idea. It's the idea that you have spins that want to point in the same direction. And at equilibrium, uh, even if you're, you, know, you have just have local interactions with the nearest neighbors, you still get spontaneous mechanization of the entire system, um, so you get a, a breaking of the symmetry. And so the, you know, the idea that physicists have when applying this to biological systems, and I want to emphasize again that uh, physicists have applied this idea to many other systems than flocking and, and the collective behavior, is that maybe you can think of this as a paradigm for thinking about many interacting agents of any sort, put them on a network of, of interactions, and maybe you'll get collective behavior in the same way you get spontaneous mechanization. So you can put, for instance, flocks of starlings on this. And you know, th this idea sounds a bit maybe uh, naive. You know, say, okay, yeah, you know, we're physicists, we know better than everybody else, so we just apply our tools. But in fact, you, know, you, you can do this construction explicitly, and this is, what, uh, this is just a summary of Alexandra's talks yesterday, by using the, the principle of maximum entropy, where you just try to have a, a probability distribution over the, the, the orientations of velocity of many birds in the flock, and you, all you do is constrain the correlation functions between pairs of, uh, of birds, and what you end up with is precisely this kind of, uh, of uh, models of interacting spins that we're familiar with in physics. In, in this case, it's called the Heisenberg model. And with this kind of thing, you can actually reproduce uh, the, long range the, the long range of correlations uh, simply from a, from a short range of interactions. So reproducing this idea from the Ising model that you get the, the spontaneous order at the large scale from just uh, the, the small scale. And uh, so, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and, and f first deconstruct this idea and, and maybe explain to you why, you know, maybe uh, the, the, the fair criticism against this kind of idea. And then, uh, you know, otherwise I, would be, I wouldn't be talking about it this way. Uh, I re rehabilitate the idea at the end. So wh what's, what's the main caveat with this kind of approach is that it's purely phenomenological. Uh, it's based on probability theory and, and maximum entropy, but then we give this interpretation in terms of, uh, of physics, of having a Hamiltonian. But you know, like physicists have, have studied talking bef you know, uh, independently of the Heisenberg model, and uh, they, they had a very pic different picture in mind. So let me explain this to you. So, so far, you know, when I, when I just presented as an introduction, we implicitly assume equilibrium, right? But there's a big difference between birds and, uh, and spins, and this was realized, of course, uh, uh, you know, in, in the 90s, as you will see, is that birds, uh, they, they actually exchange neighbors. The network is not fixed. 
And this is very important for two reasons. I mean, first of all, is that because it, it, from the physics point of view, it, it brings, it takes the system out of equilibrium. So the, maybe this should question the, the approach of trying to have an equilibrium-like uh, inference uh, procedure. But even from the, from the biological point of view, like, so, you know, they exchange neighbors, what is, what this also entails is that maybe, you know, the, the, the effective number of interaction partners that each bird has is not the one uh, that we, we get from instantaneously. So let me explain this. Like, if you're a bird, basically, as you, you know, if you integrate information from your neighbors, but, you know, if you, if you integrate over some, some time scale, so remember, you know, what you learned from your neighbors before, then if you change neighbors over time, then you accumulate some information from, from neighbors over a long time and therefore uh, over many more neighbors than you integrate at, at any given time, right? So it's basically accumulation of evidence. You have an, a larger effective number of neighbors. And from, even from a physics point of view, it's very important because this means that you can actually uh, carry information physically. So if you think about the alignment of spins, for instance, basically the alignment is just done locally from neighbor to neighbor, but all the spins are not, you know, none of them are moving. But here what happens is that not only you can transmit information by communication to the next individual, but you also physically move around the network and so you can also uh, propagate that information physically. And this, from, you know, in fact, this completely changes the phenomenology, uh, I mean, the, 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 the behavior of, of this kind of system. So this was realized uh, in the 90s, especially uh, by uh, Tu and Turner in 95. And uh, what they showed is, for instance, uh, if you look at, at con continuous spins in two dimensions, which is uh, the, the sort of model one has in mind, a continuous spin is just a continuous direction of motion. But if you're in two dimension, uh, there's a theorem that tells you that you cannot get order in, 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 uh, in two dimensions. You cannot get a spontaneous order of the, of the kind I was showing for the, for the uh, Ising model. But if you include this, uh, this uh, active uh, element, the fact that the neighbors change, then you, 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 know, you basically rescue the order and you can actually get it into dimensions. And it also changes the critical response and everything. And uh, you know, these studies were basically based on the study uh, of, the, of the Vichek model, which is uh, this one, where basically each bird, as a function of time, is taking some sort of uh, a spatial average of its neighbors uh, to determine its next uh, direction of motion. Uh, so you see it, it's quite a different model uh, than the Heisenberg model. So we, we thought about this and you, know, you see that here we, we have what looks like two contradictory descriptions. One's, one is an equilibrium description uh, from which we can actually learn useful biology and phenomenology, but then you have this dynamical uh, picture which seems to predict different things even on the, on the theoretical level. So to, to address this question, we, we decided to, to go back to similar data, not actually quite different data, but uh, where now we, we don't just focus on the, on the equilibrium properties, which you may also view as static properties, it's just single snapshots of the velocities of the bird, and now examine the dynamics and try to learn the dynamics, right? So essentially, try, can we learn something like the equations of motion of, of the flock or something of the sort uh, as the Vichek model? So of course, to do this, the first step is to actually record the dynamics, and so this is what Stefania talked about. So this is, we analyzed uh, you know, the, the flux that she, she, uh, she and others uh, recorded. So I'm, I'm not going to go too much into the details there. This, is, this was already covered. So they managed to, to get the identity in, uh, in, 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 in positions or in three dimensions of all these flux, or all these birds in the flock. And that way, you can reconstruct the collective uh, trajectory of, of, of all the birds. Right? So this is our starting point. We, we, we take these traces and try to analyze them to learn what are the equations of motion from the traces. And so in doing this, we, we want to, to stay a bit agnostic and follow the same kind of philosophy that we did for just looking at single snapshots. And by, by, by this, I mean that we, we, we don't want to maybe assume the dynamics from the beginning, but we want to learn it uh, from the data from, from first principles. And, uh, and to do this, we, we, you know, we basically generalized the, the idea that we had before, but now instead of thinking of probability distribution over all the velocities of individuals in the flock, we think of um, 
the statistics of all possible trajectories, so the collective trajectories of all the birds in the flock at all times. It can, so you can view it this way. It's like, it's like a network of interacting uh, individuals, but they also interact with themselves at different time slices. Right? And uh, so we, we describe, you know, by probability distribution over uh, the states of the, of, of the orientations at all times. And in physics, we call this an action. So this is why I'm writing this way. It's just a fancy word for the log logarithm, essentially, of, of, uh, of this probability distribution. So we'd like to learn, basically, what this action is from the data. Right? So again, you know, how, how do we do this? We need to make some assumptions. And what we, we, we'll use the same, exact same uh, trick as before, the trick of maximum entropy. So, uh, but now, so we want to maximize the entropy of the, of the distribution over trajectories. But now we, we want to put constraints not just on the correlation functions of pairs of individuals at the same time, but also what we call cross correlations, so the, the correlation function of, of uh, one individual at time t with another individual at time t plus one. And uh, if we do this, the, the kind of action that we get looks like this. It's just using the same trick uh, of maximum entropy. So you get an exponential form. And here you get these Lagrange multipliers that essentially enforce these constraints, right? So called J1 and J2. So it looks like a complicated uh, formula. But it's essentially the same thing as before, except that we added this link, these links between uh, neighbors across two different time points, right? So you can view it as a, we unfold the network in the time direction. And by the way, this is also called maximum caliber when applied to this time direction. So now we, 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 that we've done this, OK, so here I, I have the convention of t, t plus 1. And then I move to you know, uh, t plus delta t, but you, you can get it's the same idea. So we have this maximum entropy principle with the constraints on these, on these two kinds of observables. And uh, the first thing that is that one can show uh, in the spin, spin wave approximation, so the spin wave approximation was already explained by Alexandra yesterday, but let me remind you what this means. It just means that the, the, the direction of flight, the SI, which are normalized vectors, are all very close to the common direction of flight of the entire flock. So we can basically uh, re, you know, summarize this variable by how much they differ, they deviate from, from this main direction. It, it is, this, and this uh, new uh, variable which is equivalent to S would just be called pi, OK? It's just a deviation from the main direction. And uh, so the spinning wave approximation just means that these fluctuations are small, which is equivalent to saying that the flock is very polarized, which is indeed the case in the data that we've been analyzing. So in this approximation, basically, and this is an approximate equation, you can show that the maximum entropy distribution I was showing before is equivalent to a stochastic differential equation or stochastic uh, recursion equation, where each bird is basically taking some sort of weighted average over you know, all the other birds with some weights mij, so given by this matrix, plus some noise. And uh, where the noise can be uh, is delta correlated in time, but can have some correlation structure. And both m and c are just transformations of these two uh, matrices J1 and J2, which were the Lagrange multipliers uh, enforcing the constraints. Okay, so here already you can see that this looks very much like a social force model, right? Where you try to, you know, each bird is trying to make some sort of an average of its neighbors. Uh, so, you know, on the technical side, I mean, the way we show this is because, you know, the whole process is a Markov chain, and in the spin wave approximation, everything can be considered Gaussian because we just expand to second order. And so it's just a map of, uh, you know, it's called Gaussian process in some cases, but it's collective Gaussian process. So we can just write uh, explicitly the, the, the form of the conditional probability of going from one state to the next. And this is what gives us this equation. So, okay, so, so we, we've already shown, and this would be, turn out to be useful to have this kind of formula for uh, inferring the dynamics explicitly. But before we do that, we, you know, here we have a delta t, which is somewhat arbitrary parameter. And you know, we don't really know what to do with it. So what we do with it is that we 
we just send it to zero, just take the continuous limit. And, and uh, it, it kind of, you know, it's a limit that sort of makes sense. It's also, it means that on top of the constraint on the same time correlation function, now we replace this cross correlation function by the correlation function between uh, the direction of light and how it changes in time, right? So it's a correlation between these two things and this will be our new constraints and the continuous limit. And if you do this, then the social force model I just showed now it actually looks like a stochastic differential equation, which has the same interpretation as before, where each bird is trying to adjust its, uh, its direction of flight according as a weighted average of its neighbors. And if you look at this and if you stare at it, you, you realize it's exactly the same thing as the Vicek model, only you can have arbitrary weights, you can have arbitrary correlation, correlated noise, but it's the same kind of structure, right? So, Okay, once we have this, we still have uh, many things to parameterize in principle. So we have this, for instance, the, the correlation of the noise. Well, you know, to simplify, we'll assume that the noise is actually not correlated between different birds, right? That's a simplification. This allows us to, so we just say it has uh, some, some delta, oh yeah, I forgot, delta ij. So uh, it's basically determined entirely by uh, this parameter t. d here is just the dimension of the problem, so we can forget about it. And T is, can be literally uh, interpreted as a temperature. It gives you the, the amount of jitter that there is when each bird is making this, its decision. Another nice thing about this dynamics is that if you assume that the, that the network of neighbors is constant and also that it has a, it's symmetric, uh, then you can actually show that this equation uh, has a steady state. And it's in fact an equilibrium steady state, you know, technically from the physics point of view. And it's given by exactly this, which is exactly the Heisenberg model I was, I was presenting when, uh, as a consequence of the maximum entropy principle on single snapshots, right? But here, you see here, there's a, big, there's a, there's a somewhat important difference, which is that now we have explicitly this temperature here, right? So when we're doing the static inference or the equilibrium inference, we did not see this T because it was basically uh, folded into the J matrix. Whereas here, in principle, from, from this description, you can distinguish the two things. We, we see that we can actually do this. Uh, we can actually do this, infer this, this thing. Okay, so I already said how to parameterize the noise. Now, we're also going to make an assumption about the, the nature of the, interaction, of the interaction matrix, so this interaction matrix Jij. And uh, to do this, we, we, we make an assumption that, that's been somewhat, uh, that's been motivated by, by previous work. We'll assume that uh, the interaction matrix is essentially the decaying function of the order of the neighbors that you're interacting with. So, so you interact with your first neighbor with this strength, you interact with the second neighbor with this, you know, a bit, a bit less, with your third neighbor a bit less. So you, you, you number your order, your rank order, the neighbors uh, like this, and then you, you determine the strength as a function just of, of that rank, and not of the distance or anything else, just the rank, right? And it was shown uh, in the context of static or equilibrium inference that uh, this is actually what you, you know, you get an actual exponential decay. You can see it here on the log scale very nicely. So that's what we assume here. We assume this form, uh, but of course, once we have this, we we also, you know, we, we left with two parameters with J. So J can be in, in interpreted as the interaction strength. And NC uh, would be interpreted as the interaction range. So it, it tells you to, to what, you know, up to what neighbor you really effectively interact. So that's it. I mean, the, 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 the model is now parameterized. So we just have three parameters, the interaction range, interaction strength, and the temperature that was controlling the noise that I was talking about before. And uh, now that we have that, we, we just uh, use maximum likelihood fit, which can be shown to be equivalent to solving the maximum entropy model, uh, you know, using some, uh, inter some integration method that I, I will just uh, briefly go over now. So let me explain why, why we need this method in the first place. So, if you look at trajectories of, of, this, of these birds in the flocks, uh, 
you notice that they often have uh, these kind of oscillations, right? And uh, that's because you look at the center of mass, or the Barry center, as Stefania was saying. And uh, if, you, if you do this because the, the, the birds flap, the Barry center goes up and down, right? So you get these oscillations. And, and because of that, uh, it, it somewhat ultimately limits the effective sampling rate with which you're taking different snapshots. And limits precisely to about, uh, uh, sorry, it's 10 hertz. It's 0.1 seconds. Okay. So there's a mistake here. So the problem is that with such a long time, the, the usual integration methods that we use, uh, which is Euler's method, is, is likely to be imprecise. So in, instead, what we do is that we integrate, we linearize the equation, uh, and we integrate it explicitly as a function of time between t and t plus delta t. Okay. So this is done here. And this is only valid if you have a fixed network, but it's, it's, it's exact if you assume a fixed network and you, if you're in a spin wave approximation. So just more technical details. When, once you have that, you have an explicit expression of the likelihood. And then this is exactly, this is this thing that we maximize with respect to our three parameters, n, c, j, and t, right? Which are all hidden here in these, uh, in these formulas. t is here, j is here, and c is here. So we do this maximization and we get an answer. So but first, uh, before uh, actually talking about the application of this to the data, well, we first wanted to test it on synthetic data to make sure that the method actually works. So uh, you know, we just simulated the process we want to infer, right? And then we try to infer back. So here we put the birds in the, in the box to, to avoid any, any problems with the periodic boundary conditions. And then we, we take the data as if it were uh, experimental data, and we try to infer back the parameters of the model. And so you know, this, this is supposed to show you that it, it works very well. Um, but it also, it's, it's, it's the important point here is that you know, we put different value of the true interaction range and see what we get back, so it works well. And we do it here for two different sampling rates. So delta t here is the sampling rate with which we actually, you know, it's, it's not the rate with which we, we do the simulation, but the simulation is done in continuous time. But then when we do the inference, we only allow ourselves uh, to have one snapshot every second here, for instance, right? So if we use Euler's method, so Euler's method is just integration, you know, simple integration rule, uh, you can see that when this uh, delta t, the, sam the sampling uh, time is large, you, you're gonna get, you're gonna make a big error on the inferred, uh, on the inferred range. But if you use this exact integration method I was just uh, telling you about, then in that case, you get the right answer almost no matter what delta t is. Okay, so this is to show that, you know, it's not, not it, it, it works and it's a useful step to go beyond uh, Euler's approximation. Then, still on synthetic data, we can ask, okay, so we're gonna get an answer for nc, for j, and for t, and can we make a comparison with what we would get from just, so, so this inference here was done on the, as I said, on the, on, on the dynamics, so trying to learn directly the equations of motion. But can we compare to what we would get if we did the, the so-called static inference or the equilibrium inference? And this is what this gives. And you can see that the, the answer is actually depends on, on the parameters of the model. So when the interaction strength is fairly large, you see that the static and equilibrium inference give pretty much the same answer, right? So uh, equilibrium here is, is just doing inference on, on, on the single snapshot, whereas the exact inference is, is actually doing it on successive snapshots. So in that case, you get the, the right answer. But now imagine that uh, the interaction strength is a bit lower. In that case, you can see that when you take the equilibrium inference, you completely overestimate the interaction range. And this is exactly what I was telling you about before, which is that when you do this equilibrium inference, you know, essentially what you're capturing is the effective number of neighbors. And here the effective number of neighbors is actually much larger than the instantaneous one. It's when you get this discrepancy. So, why do you get the right answer in one case and not in another case? I leave that to a further slide, but it's just something for you to, to think about. 
Now, the, the, you know, the, the real question for us is, if we look at the data, in, what, in which of these two, two situations are we? And uh, the answer is that we, in this situation, which is the good one, in which uh, the two things agree. So here, this is application to the actual flux that I was just showing before. And uh, he, what I want you to really, uh, you know, what, what I really want to stress is that the, the two answers here are, are obtained by completely different types of information. Right? This is just obtained by a single snapshot, by just looking at the state, you know, the statistics of things you see in a single snapshot. Whereas here, this is obtained by learning what happens when you look at one snapshot and then the next. And it, 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 it's really a non-trivial um, prediction that the, you know, the two things should agree. Because it really means that uh, a steady state distribution here uh, can, be, uh, can be predicted as a consequence of the equations of motion. And again, you know, uh, here, you know, uh, here we, I'm showing just the interaction range, the, the fact that we, we get it right. So these are 14 flocking events, and each of them has a different interaction range. Um, there's something else that we can infer, which is the interaction strength and temperature. And that case where we need to compare, of course, is J over T, because as I said, it's folded into, uh, it, it's folded into the, the, the J in the, in the equilibrium inference. And for that also, we get a, a fairly good agreement. So why is it that after everything I told you that the out of equilibrium aspect, the fact that the neighbors change, that the effective number of neighbors should be higher, how come that this actually still works on the actual data, the, the fact that the, this equilibrium inference gives the right answer, so to speak? Well, to understand this, I, I need to exp you know, maybe introduce uh, the, the time scales that are in the problem. So you, 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 you can think of, uh, okay, I think that two main time scales. One of them is, how do birds, how fast do birds align with their neighbors? So imagine you have a, a bird here, which is misaligned with all its neighbors. Uh, because it tries to, it, it's, it's, it's driven by this social force, they will try to realign with the neighbors. And like this, and it takes some time, and that's what we call tau relax. It's a relaxation time of the alignment. So that's one time scale. And then there's a second time scale, which is, how fast it takes for a bird to change its neighbors, right? So because it's, oh yeah, sorry. The, the first one, this relaxation time, time scale, as I argue in the next slide, in a couple of slides, is essentially given by, by J times NC. You can see it scales like uh, one over time, right? So tau relax is given by the inverse of this. So, so the second one is uh, how fast each bird uh, uh, renews its neighborhoods. So how long it takes to completely, to, to have a complete turnover in the set of neighbors, right? And that's what we call tau network. And that we can directly read off from the data. Uh, I'm not going to show how, but uh, just looking at the autocorrelation function of the, of the, ne of the network uh, neighborhoods. So what happens in this system, in, in the actual data, is that if we recall these two guys, you see that the, the time scale that uh, governs the network rearrangements is much slower than the ones of relaxation. So what this means is that what I was saying about the birds keeping memory of the alignment and carrying it to the neighbors and everything, that's not actually really true. Because they keep very little memory of, uh, of things over time. This is what this time re relaxation time scale means. So it's, about, it's less than a second, right? So after you know, less than a second, they completely forgotten information from previous neighbors. And since they changed neighbors over a time scale of 10 seconds, by the time they've renewed their neighborhood, their, their, their neighborhood uh, they will have forgotten the information about the, the previous neighborhood. So in other words, they always you know, really align with the local neighbors that they have now. And this is essentially, this is really the, 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 the fundamental reason why uh, the, the equilibrium inference works. And now we can come back to this thing I already showed. So this was the case where it didn't work, and the reason why it didn't work is because in that case, the tau relax, so which is given by the inverse of this, was of the same order of magnitude as the, as the uh, network relaxation, the network uh, rearrangement time scale. You can see the, the ratio of the two in this, in this plot here was about 100. Sorry, in this plot was about 100, so we get a clear separation of timescales. 
Whereas in this case, where you get the overestimation, it's when it was of the order of one. OK, so now you might, might be worried that, uh, you know, does it mean that you know, I have to throw away all the, the nice uh, theory of Turner and Tool I was introducing the, the talk with? And the answer, answer, of course, is no, you shouldn't do that, right? And uh, the, the reason is because you know, the, this relaxation time scale is not the only re, uh, time scale that, that, that matters, in fact. To, so to, to do this, you, you, it's useful to, to take a, a, a vcheck light model and put it on a square like this, right? So forget about the, na the neighbor exchanges, because I already said that it's slow compared to the other time scales. And let's assume that all our birds are on a, on a regular lattice. In that case, you can take some uh, continuous limit in which this, uh, this pi, which is basically, remember, the fluctuation uh, with respect to the main direction is, is, is driven by this equation. Right? And uh, you know, we can go in Fourier space and write the so-called Green's function that describes uh, the fluctuations of this. And from that, you can actually write an equation for uh, the relaxation uh, autocorrelation function uh, which takes this form in the end, right? And so, so forget about the details maybe here, but this tells you basically how much power there is in the fluctuations at each, uh, at each k, where k basically gives you an order of magnitude of 1 over the distance, right? And what this said, well, if you look at this equation, you see that you have a 1 over k squared, and this thing actually diverges when k goes to 0. So it means that you get so-called infinite power of fluctuations for very, very long time scales. Right? And when, you, when you're in that situation, also if you look at the relaxation, when k goes to 0, the relaxation here is infinitely slow. Right. So what happens in, the, in, you know, in, in a system like this is that things, the, the, you know, any perturbations will propagate through the entire flock, but it will take infinitely long to do so. So if you think of this relaxation here, the global relaxation time, it will be given by the by the, by the cutoff here uh, in K, which is 1 over L, and is given by this thing that diverges with the system size. L is the system size in this case. Right? So the gl global relaxation time scale is extremely large if you have an infinite flock. Right? However, that's not what concerns us here, because what we really care about, you know, sorry, so is, is, is really the relaxation time scale locally, right? The relaxation time scale with respect to just your neighbors. And that's given by you know, the same equation here, but instead of putting cutoff at 1 over L, which is the, the size of the entire network, it's, it's given by 1 over RC, where RC is the, is the range in the interaction range expressed in, uh, um, expect, uh, expressed in, uh, in actual length. Right? In that case, you get this tau relax, which is pretty much what I was uh, assuming before with this corrective factor, which is of order 1. What, what's really important here is that the relaxation time scale over which the inference is done, which is a local time sc uh, length scale, uh, is fast enough. Right? It doesn't mean that the, the scale over the entire system is fast. And uh, OK. So, so that's it. I mean, we, 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 you know, at this point, we're fairly happy because we, we've done a, a, a dynamical inference. We've done a static inference. The two things agree. We understand why. But there's a but, there's kind of a problem, which is that we've been assuming some dynamics that's inconsistent with some other features of the data. And you know, let me just tell you briefly before, before wrapping up why that's the problem. So uh, in the previous paper, uh, the, 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 the Rome collaboration showed that there was a ballistic trans transport of information in the, in the flock, meaning so they saw that during turns. Basically, what this means is that when some bird is changing direction, the way this information propagates through the rest of the flock does it in, the, in a linear way in time, like a wave. Right? But if you think about the VCheck model or the kind of model that we have, this kind of model, and uh, you know, the, what this model would, would uh, instead predict is that when you have a turn, the information would basically decay as a function of distance. And the reason for that is because if you take this equation and you do the same trick of taking the continuous limit I just explained before, if you look at the, the structure of this equation, it's essentially a diffusion equation. So the diffusion equation, you get, you, get a, you get a perturbation somewhere, and then basically diffuses very slowly, like the square root of time, and also decays. 
So not exactly what we, what we expect from, 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 from this data. And so to, 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 to rescue this, you, you need basically, that's what we, they, they, they showed in the, in the first paper and then we, we proposed a more detailed model in the second paper here, is that you actually need to uh, go to a second order dynamics. And basically, what, what, so this is the equation, but basically the basic idea is that it's like adding a mass or adding momentum to your system. So if you think of a, of a, of a damped oscillator, uh, we add this, uh, this second order term, which corresponds to this inertial term. Uh, and that's what uh, will allow the, 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 the you know, to, the ways to propagate because if you linearize this equation the same way I did before, then you get an equation of that form. And so this is the damping as before, but here now you see this looks exactly like a wave equation. Right? So you get a second order derivative in time and then it's known you know, from since uh, the 18th century that this kind of equation can support a wave solution and therefore can explain why information propagates linearly. And we, you know, we showed this explicitly by simulating this model and by showing that a turn can actually propagate so that the entire flock can turn together instead of having just a few liters uh, and uh, you know, do the turn and then the flock uh, splitting. So, um, Okay, so, so you know, that, that's another piece of information for you and, and basically you know, what we need to do at some point is, is reconcile these two things. So these are my conclusions. I mean, the, 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 main, the main really uh, message I want you to, to remember is that uh, you know, in the real flux there's a separation of time scales between the, the rearrangements of the neighbors and the relaxation time scale and this is why the, this, uh, this equilibrium inference and dynamical inferences give the same answer. And then, you know, the caveat is that, you know, really to, to explain what happens in this flux, we would need a second order dynamics with this uh, be behavioral mass to explain the inner propagation. So what we need to do next is to, to do this kind of inference, uh, both uh, in birds, but also in swarms, because as uh, Andrea showed yesterday, uh, there's also evidence for this kind of second order dynamics in swarms. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you.